Greetings, everyone, and good morning, afternoon, or evening to you, depending on your local time. Welcome to the National Institute of Mental Health webinar series presented by the Office for Disparities Research and Workforce Diversity. I am Dr. Dawn Morales, Chief for American Indian and Alaska Native Mental Health and the moderator for today's webinar, titled Strength in the Face of Challenge, Youth Suicide Prevention Research Among the White Mountain Apache and the Navajo Nation in the Time of COVID-19. To help us, we have Dr. Gosh, Joshua Gordon, Director of the National Institute of Mental Health to give us some opening remarks. Dr. Gordon. Thank you, Dr. Morales. And thank you to everyone, uh, speakers and attendees uh, for joining us today. Research on preventing suicides has been and continues to be a top priority at NIMH. And although we've made considerable progress in understanding how to prevent suicide, much remains to be done. Much remains to be done, especially in vulnerable communities. And amongst the most vulnerable are individuals in American Indian and Alaska Native communities who face a much higher toll, a much higher burden from suicide and mental illness more generally than the general population. Suicide, though, is not just about burden and statistics. Suicides create terrible losses for all involved and the effects on the loved on their uh, individuals loved ones and on their communities are truly devastating despite these devastating losses the american indian and alaska native communities have shown and continue to show tremendous resilience and that's what makes conducting research within these communities so important and so fruitful because number one the need is great and number two, the resilience is equally great. It's important that we recognize the key role for conducting community-engaged research, both uh, in Native American communities in general, and also particularly so in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted these communities so much more than uh, the average community elsewhere. The pandemic has also dramatically affected our abilities to conduct research in these communities, and the scientists you are going to hear from today have had to adapt their approach in concert with the communities that they serve. And so I think it'll be illustrative for us to hear about that work today. I want to thank again everyone for coming. I want to thank the uh, researchers and community members who are going to speak with us today about the research, about the results, and about the promise for the future. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Morales. Thank you. Thanks. First, a few housekeeping notes. Please submit your questions via the Q&A box at any time. Also, please use the Q&A box to indicate any technical difficulties you may experience with hearing or seeing the webinar at any time. Our webinar series continues throughout the summer and fall and you may register for them on the same website you use to register for this one. And now that that is out of the way, let me introduce the research team who will present today. Each of them is associated with the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health, and in many cases have an additional affiliation which they may mention as he, she, or they first speak. The researchers speaking today are Dr. Allison Barlow, Dr. Mary Swick, Mr. Mitchell Garcia, Ms. Rose Suttle, Dr. Emily Harose, Dr. Jared Ivanich, and Dr. Victoria O'Keefe. The webinar will begin with Allison Barlow, who will provide some background and context that informs the research approach and methodology. Allison. Thank you so much, Dr. Morales and, and Dr. Gordon. We are so honored to be with all of you today and to share our work and the outstanding innovations that are coming from the White Mountain Apache and Navajo Nations. First, I want to um, direct our attention as we gather together virtually from across the country, um, that together we humbly acknowledge the indigenous peoples of our homelands. We are all on traditional and contemporary native lands we encourage you all to go to this site when you can to know and honor the native lands where you reside and work. 
Our center was founded in 1991 at Johns Hopkins um, Bloomberg School of Public Health by Dr. Matu Santosho. He had spent um, over 10 years prior to that um, working with the White Mountain Apache and Navajo Nations, as well as some other Southwestern tribal communities to address was founded, um, our mission, which remains the same, is to work in partnership with Native communities to raise health education and health leadership to the highest possible level. And we do that by working in partnership with tribal communities and community members um, to co-create strength-based solutions that honor and promote tribal sovereignty. The center has three core arms, um, very important and integral to all the arms is our training and scholarship program where we are singularly focused right now on um, developing and supporting early career uh, indigenous scientists um, through their um, professional development. We know that their leadership is incredibly important to the future of not only science, but really the planet. And I'll explain more what I mean as we go on. We also have an active infectious disease prevention group. This is our oldest group at our center and they were critical to um, the COVID response and our behavioral mental health promotion group. And we're all representing our mental health group that's um, led at our center by Dr. Mary Swick. So our center has focused on building um, interventions, co-creating interventions in partnership with tribal communities that plug in across the life course. You're seeing many of them on this slide, but those that are um, highlighted in yellow all have a mental health focus. So you'll see that, that these um, overlap many stages of the lifespan. We've had a four decade partnership with Southwestern tribal communities and that foundation has provided the trust to do the incredibly sensitive work that it takes to address uh, youth suicide and other behavioral health issues. We've been able to work on interventions with the White Mountain Apache and Navajo Nation that have now scaled to over 140 tribal communities across 21 states. This youth suicide prevention work is our latest example. And as you'll hear today, we're working with um, far, almost uh, 10 different tribal communities on this work. COVID significantly expanded the scope of our center's work. Um, as we began to work with the Southwestern tribal communities to address COVID and to learn from the Navajo Nation and White Mount Apache what could be effective, we were contacted by dozens more tribes to help with their support. We also were able to partner, um, Mary, you can go to the next slide, partner with national agencies, including the National Indian Health Board, NCAI, and the National Council of Urban Indian Health um, to be able to support programs across every tribal community in the country. And in spite of the highest rates in the Southwestern tribal communities, you're looking now at, at publicly available graphs from the White Mount Apache tribe as an example, that you could see the exact same graphs from Navajo Nation. In spite of the highest rates and the most severe conditions to address the pandemic from poor water access to overcrowded homes, to long distances, to healthcare, in spite of all of that, Tribes have been able to wrestle COVID to the ground ahead of every other US community. We adopted a, a mantra during this work, which was all we can do is everything that we can do as COVID was shedding light on these long standing inequities. The New York Times covered the incredible work of the White Mountain Apache um, during the pandemic. And, and they really zeroed in on saying, you know, what is it that's working so well to mitigate disease after these very high rates? And they landed initially on contact tracing. And it's true, the contact tracing that was done within the White Mountain Apache community was, was world-class. But really it took incredible wraparound services connected to that contact tracing that really made the difference. So for example, um, with both White Mountain Apache and Navajo, we knew that many homes, 30, 40% on Navajo didn't have running water. So took to employing folks to build hand washing stations. The White Mountain Apache tribe came up with the idea of employing local folks to sew masks because there was so little PPE. 
Um, there are wellness boxes and food boxes delivered to all people who are in quarantine isolation, really prioritizing the elders and um, people with, with young families who, who could be more at risk. And then finally, task shifting. And this is a huge part of our suicide prevention work, training up paraprofessionals who could do testing. And eventually, they ended up um, helping with vaccination as well. We know that what's coming behind this is an enormous mental health burden and our center has tried very hard to get out in front of it. So on the left-hand side, you see a, a wellness box that includes um, things for communities who are under stress, not just food, but getting out children's toys and books. Um, the book you're seeing in the foreground, Our Smallest Warriors, Our Strongest Medicine, was led by Dr. O'Keefe and Dr. Harris um, with a tribal advisory group to help young parents address COVID with their children and, and, and give them the strengths of their ancestors and their traditions to um, make that journey. Culture Forward is a brand new um, uh, toolkit for tribal communities that is strengths-based, again, led by Dr. O'Keefe with our team. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you're seeing a new indigenous psychological first aid that this team developed and is now using to train um, frontline workers who've experienced incredible stress. In the meantime, we're turning toward new proposals that are helping address comorbid mental health with um, chronic diseases like diabetes and cancers. And this is just a picture to honor, um, excuse me, um, Novaline Gokla, she couldn't be with us today. Uh, she's an incredible team member and um, is experiencing um, a family medical emergency right now, but um, I know she would wanna be with us and just wanna honor her. So as we begun to think about these wraparound services, we thought about a model which we're calling TriProtect, and that is really integrating supportive isolation and quarantine, contact tracing, diagnostic testing, and now vaccinations. And as this churns more and more, we're thinking about contact tracing as a means to actually reach people who are experiencing mental distress as a result of COVID. And we're building modules that plug into other home visiting interventions that we have that will help those families who are experiencing grief burdens, um, PTSD, anxiety, and other mental health issues. Next slide. But I really just want to take a moment to celebrate today at this incredible success of um, Native Americans now lead the country in um, vaccination, even though they started under such duress. And uh, Victoria O'Keefe really captured this in a recent Washington Post article. What's at the heart of this is the sense of collective responsibility, collective will. And that is actually informing uh, suicide prevention work as well. So I just want to embed this in an indelible way in your minds that what we're learning from Indigenous communities about the power of collective will is what we need to address mental, behavioral, and infectious disease challenges across the globe. So the experience of COVID has really sharpened our um, center strategic directions. We're actually undergoing a, a large strategic planning process, but we just want to share with you um, research focus in the next um, five to 10 year horizon. So in particular, we know that we have to continue to, to follow the arc of, re, of rigor of previous research. And we'll be showing you today that we have been working with the White Mountain Apache Tribe on, on suicide prevention since 1993. We have learned so much to bring to bear on this issue, especially as we see youth suicide um, becoming an issue across the globe in a way never seen before. We also are really in in um, standing up exemplars of next generation CBPR. And what we mean by that is not only, you know, sharing power, sharing um, community will and um, directions for, for research, but actually continuing to iterate this research based on community input and data input that's coming in um, an iterative process, which we're thinking a little bit about precision public health methods as I talk about this, but how can we continue to use the power of CBPR to continuous and continuously improve the quality of the research and interventions and then the implementation science. 
Third, um, we are wholly committed to strengths-based approaches. We, we know from the work in that culture forward guide that um, we shared earlier is really all about what tribal communities have known since time immemorial. And that is if we start even before health promotion, even before that, how do we stand on the strengths of community to power generations forward with the strengths of their ancestors, their traditions, their cultures that protect them against these um, inherent risks. And then last, the uh, commitment to uh, a rapid translation of evidence to practice. And we'll be explaining more about that, but we've learned a lot about how to do that in a quicker way. And just um, in terms of methods that, again, we're finding are really guiding forces in our work as we move forward is the need for new explanatory models. And that's, this is really um, hinged on this idea of strengths-based work. Um, what kinds of frameworks do we need to continue to iterate or design from the ground up? And what um, measures that are reliable um, can we fit into those new frameworks to ensure that we're understanding what is happening in indigenous communities that is working? Um, secondly is to, from the onset designed for sustainability. And as one example of this, almost all of our work has been designed. So it is sustainable in local communities because of the workforce who is available and being trained. So in this case, the idea of community mental health workers as the frontline workers in much of the mental health work that we're doing that is both around promotion and prevention. Third, implementation science. So how can we draw on implementation science to ensure rapid translation and scaling of the work that we find to be effective through this hub research and other research that we're working on? Fourth, machine learning. We really feel grateful that we received supplemental funding for the hub to really dive into a machine learning as a way to predict um, risk and to then be able to allocate our resources in the most um, critical and efficient ways to help those who need help most in the moment. And then finally, precision science and system thinking approaches for maximum impact. We'll go into each thing more in depth. So just before I hand it over to, um, to my colleague, Dr. Mary Swick, this is a long horizon when you think about um, youth suicide prevention research. So in 1993, our, I had started with our center in 1991. In 1993, the head of the Tribal Health Division called, made a call out to us at an advisory board meeting. She said, we need your help. We have lost 11 young people from suicide. We don't know what to do. That was the beginning of the work. And um, we learned very quickly about how important tribal specific data is to understand rates and patterns locally. We couldn't data regionally, we needed to get it from the local tribal area. Secondly, just really working to understand the risk and protective factors through um, quantitative and qualitative research with youth who attempted to so really learning from them directly, what were the precipitants of their suicide, what kind of care did they think would help, what did they think would keep them safe. And then next to really um, do a case control study where we are understanding what was the difference between healthy youth who are visiting the ED and youth who are at risk for um, binge drinking, which the, the tribe did an amazing thing, which was um, to understand that binge drinking and drug use on the spectrum of self-harm so that now their community-based surveillance system tracks both binge drinking and drug use, suicide, ideation, attempt, deaths, and um, non-suicidal self-injury. Next, we went through an, a long phase of working through CBPR to develop brief interventions for suicide, um, both in terms of identifying those at risk and connecting them to care. You'll hear more about that. And also um, around mental health promotion through an elders curriculum. And we continue to develop new models such as the Youth Entrepreneurship Prevention and Outcomes Study that is showing that actually engaging youth in entrepreneurship activities that are culturally based um, is really helping them to reduce um, binge drinking, drug use, um, suicide risk, and um, violence. So I'm so happy to turn it over to Dr. Swick and thank you for your time today.
Thank you, Dr. Barlow. I'm excited to transition this part of the webinar to really talk about our portfolio of NIH research. And I have the honor of starting with talking about our Southwest Hub. So our Southwest Hub is really, it's a U19 collaborative mechanism, and it's really focused around these brief interventions that Dr. Barlow mentioned, really focusing on preventing suicide, but also promoting mental health. Our research core for this collaborative hub is really built in a longstanding partnership that Allison described previously. And this work includes 10 years plus of suicide prevention with the White Mountain Apache tribe. This work is named Celebrating Life. And it really is built on a foundation of community-based suicide surveillance, follow-up and case management. The system has been recognized nationally by different agencies. In addition, linked to this system is really a public health approach to suicide prevention that is comprehensive and covers universal, indicated, and selected tiers of prevention. The important foundation of all of this work is our community mental health workers as well, who are really implementing all aspects of this program. And what we have learned over these 10 plus years and what we continue to learn through our current hub trial is that we are really in need of culturally based healing modalities to fit native cultural understanding of mental health, to target culturally informed protective factors, and to bridge gaps left by our traditional models of Western mental health care. What I wanna highlight next is some data from this Celebrating Life system that really preceded our application for the U19 hub. This surveillance system and comprehensive approach that the White Mountain Apache enacted actually was associated with a significant decrease in suicide deaths. You can see here as you look at the bar graph and as other rates were increasing or staying steady over time, the White Mountain Apache rate in the dark blue went down significantly. And this is really a landmark finding as it's one of only a few studies to find an association uh, with suicide deaths uh, decreasing. In addition, we actually had similar findings for suicide attempts as well. So as you can see here by looking at the graph, there is a trend for suicide attempts going down over time when this comprehensive public health approach was active. And this was true for both males and females. This really poised us for our current Southwest Hub trial and led to our current study design. So what our current hub is doing is using a factorial design to evaluate four different combinations of interventions. The first intervention is called New Hope and it's a risk reduction approach. The second intervention is called Elders Resilience, and this is really focused on mental health promotion. In addition, we have case management, which is really the standard of care in this community, and that is what is attached to that suicide surveillance system that we have described. The group that we're targeting with our Southwest Hub are White Mountain Apache adolescents ages 10 through 24. That's the highest risk age range in this population. And they are at risk for suicide because they've come through the surveillance system for suicide ideation, suicide attempt, or binge substance use with recent suicide ideation. And our hub trial will allow us to really examine the short and longer term effects on suicide ideation, which is our primary outcome, and resilience, which is our secondary outcome. A little bit more about our interventions. So our first intervention that we are gonna talk about is New Hope, and this is a culturally adapted intervention. And it's important to really hone in on that. So what that means is we took a, a Western evidence-based intervention that was developed by Mary Jane Rother and Boris, and also adapted by Jonas Arnell and Tony Spirito and others. And we really adapted it to fit the White Mountain Apache context and community. 
Again, it is really focused on the time after a suicide attempt or a risk event uh, to really provide psychoeducation and to connect that at-risk youth to traditional healers, caring adults, give them a safety plan and get them motivated to continue in longer term treatment. This intervention typically takes place over one session and is two to four hours. And again, it's delivered by our local community mental health workers. The second intervention is really, we see it as a complementary um, and different approach. And this uh, is our elders curriculum. And the aim of this is really to promote mental health and resilience among our Apache youth. Again, it also is a brief intervention and it's focused really solely on cultural strengths, Apache knowledge, language, and stories. Elders deliver this intervention um, with one of our community mental health workers. You can see it's a similar length. And in this intervention, the elders uh, likely won't even talk about suicide. So it's a very different type of intervention, really promoting strength. Here you can see the study design for our trial. And so a couple of things that are important to highlight here, you can see that the surveillance system is how we are identifying the at-risk youth. You can see, I'm gonna to try to use my mouse here to show you guys that the first randomization point here, youth are randomized to either get New Hope plus case management or case management alone. Then they're followed some more over time and continue to receive case management. And then there's a second randomization point. At that second randomization point, they're randomized to elders plus case management or case management alone and then follows longer over time. And so you can see that that ends up in four different combinations that youth may receive. And our target sample size is 304. In um, our study, we'll also be able to look at some secondary aims to really understand the mediators and mod moderators of treatment effectiveness. So we might hypothesize that males, for example, might respond to one intervention um, better than the other, or that older youth versus younger youth may respond differently. And our, our study design will allow us to look at that. In addition, we're really harnessing um, some of the power of implementation science under Dr. Harris's leadership to look at the acceptability, feasibility, and capacity for sustainability of these interventions in the Apache community, but also with our different partnering sites. So in summary, this uh, Southwest Hub research trial, is some takeaways that we really want you to hone in on is to really, um, these decisions about a culturally adapted intervention um, like New Hope versus a culturally grounded or built from the ground up intervention like our elders intervention should really be made collaboratively with the communities and there's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, this community-based approach has really been the bedrock of everything we do. Uh, in addition, the partnership that the U19 continues to support and to grow, and that infrastructure is really critical for our Apache JHU partnership. And it's really um, fostering and leading to culturally tailored public health approaches to suicide prevention, where we really have the time and breadth and depth to really design interventions with the community that are gonna really impact and be sustainable and feasible there. In addition, at the end of the study, we'll really be able to understand locally what combination of interventions best meet the needs of the youth in the community. As we talked about earlier, they had a comprehensive public health approach, but this study will really help us unpack which pieces of that public health approach are most impactful and for whom. And lastly, and importantly, we have a lot of partners across the Southwest and across the United States who are really interested in these suicide prevention interventions. And so through our hub grant, we are able to engage them in learning about what we're doing and then adapting the interventions for themselves with possible evaluation in their communities in the future. 
And I have the honor of turning it over next to Dr. Victoria O'Keefe, who is going to talk about that administrative core and some of those key partnerships. Thank you, Dr. Swick. It's my pleasure to talk about our Southwest Hub Administrative Core. And our Administrative Core includes the White Mountain Apache Tribe, the Navajo Nation, San Carlos Apache Tribe, Wallapai Tribe, Cherokee Nation, and the Fort Peck Tribes. And we just wanna say from our whole team that we are so grateful for all of the families and for all of the communities who partner with us in this work. The goal of the Administrative Corps is to build a collaborative network of tribal leaders, investigators, interventionists, service providers, and service users to reduce suicide among American Indian youth and promote mental health and wellness. And on this, on this slide, you'll see um, many photos, and these are photos of just some of our partners in this important work. And this took place during our first annual in-person meeting together that was hosted by the White Mountain Apache Tribe. And we worked together to achieve the goal of the administrative core by sharing knowledge. This includes like things like sharing best practices and policies. So for example, sharing what we know um, from the White Mountain Apache Tribe's amazing celebrating life suicide surveillance and case management and comprehensive public health approach to suicide prevention among all of the tribal partners to learn how can they have a similar system within their context. We also share information about the brief interventions and how communities may also adapt those within their context. We also share resources. So if we see grants that may be of interest that are focused on suicide prevention or substance use, we'll share those with our tribal partners. We also share conferences that we think they might be interested in. And of course, over the last year, we've had a number of COVID-19 materials and resources that we've been sharing. There's also a focus on implementation and sustainability among our administrative core to ensure sustainability of these programs within our tribal community partners. We also provide technical assistance. So there are various activities that we do with all of the partners. We have regular phone or virtual meetings with each of our tribal partners. We also have one annual in-person meeting and one annual phone and virtual meeting so that all of the partners can really interact with one another. And then there's also a lot of training and support between tribal partners themselves. So for example, the White Mountain Apache tribe might go out to the Cherokee Nation and do some training and support with them or the Wallapai tribe might travel down to the White Mountain Apache tribe partners for training and support. So there's a lot of co-learning that's constantly happening among this group. And then again, ongoing resource sharing um, as we see things that pertain to all of our tribal partners. We have some research that's also embedded within the administrative core. And this is a KO1 award led by Dr. Emily Harrows with a goal of maintaining the gains made in suicide prevention and helping other tribes to achieve and maintain these as well. So aim one of this KO1 study is to identify actionable sustainment strategies to promote the sustainment of the Celebrating Life program across tribal settings. Aim two is to use a community-based systems dynamic model of celebrating life implementation and sustainability to help in prioritizing sustainment strategies to implement. And aim three is to measure the effects of sustainment strategies on sustaining celebrating life in each tribal setting. So very important work within our administrative core. And now I'm gonna shift slightly and briefly discuss my K01 award that builds upon the decades of amazing collaborative work of, with between our Center for American Indian Health and the White Mountain Apache Tribe. And it's focused on the elders resilience curriculum and building empirical evidence around this culturally grounded American Indian youth suicide prevention intervention. Just to give you some background and some context, Allison mentioned this earlier as well, but indigenous knowledges, values, and traditions support the health, well being, and daily life of communities. And they've been promoted and practiced for generations. 
More and more indigenous communities and indigenous researchers are calling for culturally grounded interventions. And these interventions have a focus and are centered in indigenous culture, values, and worldviews. And that should be at the forefront of intervention design, implementation, and evaluation. However, there are some current research gaps. For example, we, we have a lack of research identifying and understanding the core components of culturally grounded Native youth suicide prevention interventions. We also don't have as many theoretical models that are co-created with Indigenous communities and that privilege Indigenous voices, communities, values about youth strengths that protect against suicide. And finally, we don't have as much evaluation of culturally grounded native youth suicide prevention interventions with culturally appropriate and relevant measures. So the Elders of Resilience curriculum, you heard Dr. Mary Swick speak earlier about a brief intervention that elders deliver to youth. And that brief intervention was adapted from a longer school-based program that's year long. And in this longer school-based program, elders go into schools and they teach a curriculum focused on White Mountain Apache culture, values, traditions, and language to youth ages 11 to 14. Since 2014, the elders have taught this curriculum to more than 1,000 youth. So this KO1 research is an exploratory mixed method study in collaboration with our White Mountain Apache tribe partners focused on the elders resilience curriculum. And aim one is to gather individual family and community perspectives on cultural protective factors of suicide and how those map onto core components of the elders resilience curriculum to inform a co-created theoretical model. Aim two is to select and culturally adapt measures to assess outcomes and key causal mechanisms of the elders resilience curriculum. And then aim three is to pilot the elders resilience curriculum theoretical model, culturally informed measures and the feasibility and acceptability of a culturally acceptable evaluation that we will decide collaboratively between myself and the community about what is the best evaluation for this study. And the future goals of this study is to test the effectiveness in a larger trial. And the overall hope is that we can scale this intervention to other tribes, including our Southwest tribal partners. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jared Ivanich, who will begin talking about some of our Southwest Hub supplements. Thank you so much. Excuse me. Um, thank you so much for um, introducing some of that work. Um, I'm, as mentioned, Jared Ivanich. Um, I'm an affiliate with the center. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado with the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health. And I'm a member of the Matlakatla Indian community. So I'm excited to be in this space with you all today to talk about some of our supplements. The first of which I'll be talking about is the cost effectiveness supplement. So as you can imagine, as we've been listening to all of the amazing work that's been coming out of the partnership between the White Mountain Apache Tribe and Johns Hopkins, many other communities hear about these efforts and wanna understand what would it cost for them to implement those. So one aspect of this uh, supplement is to be able to better understand the costs associated with implementing some of these brief interventions. But today we'll be focusing a little bit more on the second aim of the cost effectiveness um, uh, supplement, which is to um, better understand the burden associated with, um, with suicide and depression. So to this end, we enrolled 200 Native youth um, in a vignette study to rate their quality of life of two separate characters, one of which um, in, the, in the vignette was described an individual that was likely um, had suicide ideation and risk for suicide. And the second um, was an individual characterized as having depression. Um, and so we had uh, some innovations around implementing this survey with our community partners that we heard from them of how we can better improve on some of the prior methods that typically are implemented to get this kind of data. 
So we implemented a, an auto re audio recorded um, uh, implementation of these vignettes to participants so they wouldn't have to read. Um, they were recorded by community members, so they sounded and uh, were uh, in concert with communities understanding of their local understanding in their world, right? Um, and it was developed through an iterative process with local staff and community members. So we, we made several trips out to the uh, to the tribe and, and worked with them to develop what these scenarios and these vignettes would look like. And the ratings that individuals did were uh, around their health of the health status of this character rather than oneself, which is the typical approach that many take when trying to collect this type of uh, quality of life measure and to assess this burden. And to give you a little um, uh, understanding and flavor of what one of these vignettes would look like, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to one of our community partners, Rose, for uh, a brief reading of one of those vignettes. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Rose for that. Um, good afternoon. My name's Rose Murray, and I'm um... White Mountain Apache, and I work with John Hopkins celebrating life suicide prevention. So one of the vignettes is Sarah has been thinking that life is not worth living, especially when she's alone. She feels like no one really loves her and that her family and friends would be happier if she were not around. She thinks a lot about death and dying and has even thought about how she would end her life. Sometimes she feels like suicide is the only option that it would... Um, solve all her problems. She's having trouble getting these thoughts to stop. They're like a broken record playing over and over. When she has trouble at school, trouble finding a job and has a disagreement with her family and friends, she thinks that no one would care if she died. She feels, she feels guilt and shame and sometimes has given her things away and said goodbye to friends and family as if it were the last time she would see them. She, she has had these thoughts on and off in the past month. So that's one of the vignettes that was written, to, um, was read to the individual. So go ahead, Jared. Thanks so much, Rose. Yeah, so I hope that you all can, can see in that brief vignette that there was a lot of effort made by our our uh, partnership with the community to, to make sure that what we captured in that vignette was a reflection of how the community understands and recognizes what the risk for suicide ideation is. And so um, now just to give you a brief um, overview of some of the results from that study, um, you can see here we have around this box on this timeline, or what, what looks like a timeline here is a um, the ratings, the average ratings that we gathered from these vignettes. And so you can see that suicide ideation average score was 15.8. And as a reminder, zero is worst health and 100 is best possible health. And then depression was rated at 25.1 on average of these 200 participants, which you can see compared to some other um, similar methods that have been uh, implemented in other communities. These are significantly heavier rated burdens than for other populations. But I think that this also goes to show that culturally specific quality of life values allow for comparison and identification of the most effective interventions to reduce suicide among American Indian Alaska natives. And we think that this is really valuable because no studies to date have estimated depression or suicide uh, weights among this population. And we have the opportunity now to better understand the effectiveness of some of these brief interventions in reducing this burden in the community. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn the, the, the time back over to my colleague, Dr. Zwick. Thanks, Jared, I really appreciate that. Our next uh, supplement that we're going to talk about is about opioid use. And this is really focused again on our sample of participants in the hub study that I talked about earlier. And so what we did is we did a series of qualitative interviews. And when I say we, I mean our community partners like um, Mitchell and Rose that are on the webinar today did in-depth qualitative interviews with these participants. And it was again, a subset who endorsed on our quantitative measures 
that they had themselves engaged in recent opioid use or that they had a close family member or friend engage in use. And so if you look at our uh, sample, um, the time we uh, looked at the data it was preliminary, about 9% of our study participants reported using prescription medications not as prescribed. And as you guys will remember, these are 10 through 24 year olds in the community. You can see here by looking at the table that we tried to aim for equal representation in the older age group and the younger age group. We had more uh, females participate in the qualitative interviews. And then we had uh, about equal number of participants who engaged personal use versus uh, use by others in their lives. On the next slide, um, what you're going to see here are uh, some quotes from the data, uh, but I'm gonna summarize them a, a little bit first and then we're gonna have Rose uh, read to you guys some of the quotes. And so our interview guide was structured around getting descriptions of use in the community because we really saw this as formative work to understand opioid use among younger age groups in the Apache community. We also had a theme around the role of family, which came out as very uh, strong and important, including as an important resource. In addition, one thing that we learned by doing this study is that participants in this age group really um, talked not just about opioid use, even though that was the focus of the interview, they talked about uh, using substances of all kinds. Um, and there was some different confusion about what opioids were. Um, and so that's something that we can apply in our future research. Uh, Rose, I'm gonna invite you to read the two quotes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, the quote says, just, Maybe our internet's unstable. Yeah, so I, I unfortunately I think Rose's, so I can um, read them on Rose's behalf. I'm sorry she's unable to read them to you guys. So the first quote is just any time of the day, like I would just do it, uh, meaning take opioids. It wasn't really because I was depressed. It was just because I wanted to get high. And then uh, regarding the role of family and just talk about their ways they're feeling in life. And if they tell somebody, we'll probably bring a whole light of hope. So again, um, we are really grateful to NIH for this opioid supplement. And we really, it's really providing some foundational information for uh, future work in this community around this important topic. Um, so next, I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Ivanich, uh, we're doing a little bit of back and forth here, who's going to talk about his diversity supplement. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so just to, you know, I've been uh, so supported uh, by both the community and the team at Hopkins in terms of the research and training that needs to take place. And with their support, we wrote a diversity supplement, which as many of you know, has a research component and a training component. And so, that first research component has two aims, the first of which is to understand the individual characteristics associated with the co-occurrence of suicide and uh, opioid use uh, using individual uh, characteristics. The second aim of that research um, is to understand and assess the geospatial factors associated with the unique co-occurrence of opioids and suicide um, risk. And so, um, which leads to that training component. So um, the, the diversity summit will allow for training um, around spatial analysis and um, better understanding of place-based interventions where we hope to be able to move to more targeted place-based interventions. Um, and has also allowed for uh, extra training and resources to support grant writing, um, which led to the, the, the submission of uh, R21, which I just submitted and was just awarded that focuses on social network analysis. And so uh, this diversity supplement will continue both in terms of research and training for the next year. And I'm so grateful for the NIH and for the community partners and team at Hopkins for allowing me to do this. So thank you. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, 
Dr. Harrows uh, for her discussion of her supplement. Thanks so much, everybody, and uh, really grateful to be here with all of you and share this exciting work we've been um, doing. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about developing and implementing predictive algorithms to identify those at risk for suicide. Um, and this was supported through a supplement to the hub, um, as well as an internal grant that sort of got the project up and running. And then I've been spending time on this through my KO1. So um, as uh, you've heard, the backbone of much of our suicide prevention work and the White Mount Apache suicide prevention efforts has focused on the Celebrating Life Suicide Surveillance System. And just to give you a brief sense of what this, in, what this program looks like, um, there's a tribal mandate which requires all community members to report individuals at risk for self-injurious behaviors to a central registry system. This registry system is maintained by the Celebrating Life team. Um, the reportable behaviors include suicide death, suicide attempt, suicide ideation, non-suicidal self-injury, and binge substance use. And once that initial report is made, uh, the Celebrating Life team follows up on each report and provides case management. Um, so they, may, they verify the surveillance data. So they verify that report data with the individual to, to check on the, what actually happened and understand um, the circumstances around the event. They provide case management. And sometimes this is uh, this is often provided on an ongoing basis, kind of consistent with brief contact interventions. And then they aid that person in getting referrals. So uh, as Dr. Swick pointed out earlier and showed earlier, not only are the system, system provided really locally relevant data to inform public health suicide prevention initiatives, but the use of this local surveillance combined with case management has contributed to significant decreases in suicide in this population. So again, if you look at the six years before and six years after the surveillance system was established, the Celebrating Life program contributed to about a 38.3% decrease overall. For the next. So with that being said, um, as knowledge of the sur surveillance system has grown and the, and the community, um, the case managers continue to provide additional services, referral numbers have also increased. This then points to a need to enhance efficiency and a method to quickly identify those at risk to help in prioritize, prioritizing getting to the right people as fast as possible. So for this project, the initial research question was, how can we identify and reach people who are most at risk for suicide on the White Mountain Apache Reservation? We all know that suicide is incredibly complex. If we think about patients or people we know who have died, the factors that contribute to their death are not ever a single factor, but rather an interaction of factors and circumstances that happen over time. And it turns out that despite 50 years of research, our ability to identify those at risk for suicide is only slightly better than chance. So here's a meta regression plot showing the log odds ratios for all types of suicidal thought and behaviors across decades of research. This was published in 2017 by Joe Franklin and colleagues. You can see that this red line hovers slightly over zero, indicating across all these studies, each of the blue circles is a study, we actually know very little about what predicts suicidality. So with this evidence in mind, and given that, given that what leads someone to suicide is incredibly complex, many in the field have turned to machine learning approaches to try and leverage these to help uh, manage this complexity and identify those at risk. However, to date, most predictive modeling for suicide risk has been developed in healthcare settings with predominantly white or Hispanic populations and with limited evidence on the implementations of these models to actually improve care. There's also evidence that models developed in other contexts may actually exacerbate suicide-related health disparities. This was published in a JAMA article just recently. So with that background in mind, and thanks to a small internal funding through JHU, uh, initially, we were able to apply machine learning methods to 10 years of data from the White Mountain Apache tribe surveillance system. What we found is that our accuracy at predicting suicide attempts in the next year was promising and much better than our best known single predictor, having had a previous attempt which performed no better than chance. So here are our AUCs or area under the curves, which is a, a measure of accuracy. 
And you can see that these algorithms, which are these machine learning based algorithms called ridge regression, lasso, et cetera, actually have AUCs of 0.8 or better, which is, is substantially better than if you can click to the next slide, click, yeah, than our previous attempt, which was only about 0.5, which indicates no better than chance at predicting suicide, who, future suicide risk. Um, so this publish, uh, this work was published about a year, and we are also honored to be highlighted in Dr. Joshua Gordon's the director um, blog on health disparities back in January 2020, which seems like a lifetime ago. But... Uh, so ultimately, this information actually. Um, so ultimately, we developed these risk prediction algorithms to actually inform care and improve care. Um, so we we undertook a small qualitative study to inform our implementation of these, of these algorithms. Um, and these, this diagram here on the right actually shows the process by which our case managers use the risk flags. So this pink form completed is the follow-up form that the case managers complete when they go out and meet someone who's been reported to the system. That form that asks about verifying the data and the circumstances around the event. Um, and so the notification of the algorithm is done at the time of the follow-up visit completion. So after the time of the pink form completion, that risk flag is generated. Um, and that risk flag, uh, based on, on feedback from the case managers, is dichotomized to show low risk or high risk. But also what emerged from the qualitative study was that uh, it was very important to also trust case manager evaluation. Many of our case managers has work, have worked for um, years in the field and also have intimate knowledge about uh, the community and, and the way people sort of express suicidal risk. And so we really wanted to honor that and respect that wisdom. And so we made a pathway for a case manager to actually be able to override the algorithm assessment and, and provide a, a high risk rating. Um, these then, anybody who's uh, flagged as high risk or deemed at high risk by the case manager is then provided with a mandatory wellness check. Um, and we try and do these wellness checks longitudinally uh, through in line with brief contact interventions and the evidence for brief contact interventions. Um, these case lists and these high risk case, uh, case lists are reviewed biweekly. Um, with the team and we discuss each high risk case on a biweekly basis. So with that, actually, I'm gonna turn it to Mitchell who's gonna discuss how we use those lists. Um, good afternoon or what have you. Um, my name is Mitchell Garcia, I work with the Celebrating Life program here with uh, Hopkins in the White River office. Um, so my experience with this algorithm is once we like just how um, Emily spoke that we go and complete a pink form with these individuals that were seen um, that were seen either from the ER or referred from PD or just family that that has referred them and you know that um, that people are worried about these individuals. We'll go and meet with these individuals. Once we do that, we'll put that into into our red cap system. And when they're deemed uh, high risk, you know, we try and make it to where um, we will try and go see them almost every week, pretty much at the beginning and or the end. And typically, um, myself and Rose, uh, we go and meet with these individuals that are at risk, and if they're uncomfortable with a male presence, well, I'll, you know, we respect the boundaries of the people because the, the people do, um, there's a certain etiquette that people follow here. And um, sometimes when these individuals disclose that, um, you know, depending on their information they share during the follow-up visit, um, we tend to deem them high risk on some occasions for ourselves, even though the algorithm doesn't really put them at high risk, but what they disclosed with us makes us, you know, where it's more of an intuitive guess on some occasions. Um, <clears throat> but this algorithm is helpful when it comes to individuals that um, have disclosed they've attempted in the past six months. You know, that's, you know, an automatic red flag because, you know, we don't know if you know, how the next six months are gonna go or how the next year is gonna go for them. And typically some of the people that are struggling with suicidal ideations, 
they tend to <clears throat> have minor triggers, you know, things that we could, that we see as minor inconveniences, you know, is a big tipping point for them. And, you know, we try our best to accommodate these people when, when they're, when they're struggling um, with ideations, we keep, you know, we tell them that, you know, hey, we'll, you know, we'll check on you this day, this time. And usually, um, typically we let them know that um, we're just here to help relieve pressure. And the backside, you know, like behind the scenes, we're trying to get um, them to get counseling through ABHS, the uh, Behavioral Health Center here on the reservation or treatment through the um, binge substance use facility here on the reservation. Um, you know, so we're trying to create avenues that of, you know, of people that they're not just seeing us, um, you know, they're, uh, they're not just depending on us, but they understand that there is an entire community behind them, that they do want them to try and, you know, see the better side of life. And so that's typically what I work on and what I do. And hopefully that answers it, Emily, and I'll turn it back to Emily. That was great. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Um, uh, that was really helpful uh, to hear your perspective. And so sort of the next steps for this is um, the predictive algorithm and really connection to what Mitchell mentioned as these systems of care. So as um, this work with the Celebrating Life team has continued, um, the local health facilities and some of our hub partners have become very interested in this work and thinking about how do you expand this to the healthcare system. Um, and not only how do you expand it to the healthcare system, but how does this predictive algorithm sort of link to existing resources and providing risk stratified community care? And so um, we submitted an R01 uh, focused on um, service ready tools for uh, individuals at risk of suicide with this idea of how can we embed this in the healthcare system now? And how does this then connect to these existing really valuable resources in the community um, in different ways that, that are efficient and effective? Um, and with that, that kind of brings us back to this idea of multi-level systems of care, which was our, our original framework. And that um, individual families and communities at risk of suicide really, um, identifying risk, linking to care and prevention and treatment, and ultimately promoting, promoting recovery and resilience and how this, these processes are, are, are connected to all these different resources in the community. And just as Mitchell mentioned, sort of the whole community is here to support this, this individual or this family um, rather than just any, any, this one person feeling alone. So with that, Mary, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Mitchell and Emily. Uh, I have the honor of summarizing some of our future directions on behalf of the whole team and our partnering communities. Several of the things that we really want to leave you with and that we are really feeling uh, passionate about in the next phase of our work is to develop explanatory frameworks and conceptual models that are indigenous led and indigenous based. We feel that starting with Western models and trying to adapt them to our communities is it's not a bad place to start, but it's not enough. And that we really need to develop models from the ground up to really be able to develop the most inter effective interventions for these communities and these health disparities. In addition, we really feel that there are community-based participatory approaches and indigenous research methodologies that can really lend to this model development. In addition, we need to develop assessments that go along with these models and go along with the constructs that we're needing to measure in our studies. Uh, we all know that often we will use uh, Western measures or measures used in other contexts and try to adapt them. And again, it is a starting place, but we feel uh, strongly that developing measures from the ground up is also a really, really important next research step to address health disparities. In addition, as Dr. O'Keefe and Dr. Barlow and others have talked about today, we really uh, believe in strength-based approaches. We really need to start with promoting mental health, not just uh, preventing problems or strengthening resilience. 
starting even before upstream prevention, we might say. Thirdly, we really also have seen in our research, some research that we haven't highlighted even today, the power of early childhood interventions. And I think we, um, many of us who uh, work with children or might have developmental backgrounds understand the power of parenting, early childhood and intergenerational cycles. And we really believe that starting young, and there is data to show this in uh, Western contexts as well, can impact mental health and suicide in the long term. Fourth, we really uh, are honing in on precision approaches based on precision medicine and precision health approaches to take that and apply it to mental health. We feel like this is very important to suicide prevention. It's a complex problem. And we know in every community that individuals who think about suicide, who attempt suicide and die from suicide are very heterogeneous. And there's not a one size fits all solution to help these individuals. And we feel that these precision health approaches also can really help address cultural and contextual factors that are important in native and other communities. Lastly, we also think that implementation science has a lot to bring to bear in the work that Dr. Emily Harrows is leading. We know that if we think about implementation after the research studies and after we design our uh, interventions, it's almost too late, that we need to really think about this upfront. And this needs to be the foundation of our formative work and our intervention development. And we really um, believe in the power of community mental health worker models. As you could hear today briefly from our uh, powerful community partners, Rose and Mitchell, they are really the change agents in these communities and they really fill uh, critical gaps and provide such important services um, in these communities and have just, we cannot uh, thank them and appreciate them enough. So thank you, Cindy, and thank you. Mitchell. Um, on, on that note, uh, we have, um, we would love to have some time for some questions and we have our contact information here on the slides for, for you. Um, you can see here our colleague Novaline Goklish, who cannot be here with us today, represents our White Mountain Apache team at the site. So you can have her contact there. And we thank NIH for this invitation to present today and for all of you listening in attendance. So now I believe that we are gonna transition it and open it up for uh, questions. Hello. One. Excellent. Can't quite seem to start my video, but I will just use the audio instead. It is time for questions. And we have already seen quite a few questions posted in the Q&A. And we request that you all continue, all of the, uh, all of the rest, registrants, please continue those questions. But I will, I will start by asking if Dr. Gordon has any questions for our panelists. Well, I do. At first, I just wanted to thank all of the panelists for really crystal clear and compelling presentations. Um, and also for the work that you've put in to create a, um, a system that not only will answer questions for the future, but also provides services for the here and now uh, at the same time, uh, while looking to address, I think, issues that are really key for NIMH to address uh, really across our portfolio, uh, particularly um, impressed with the focus on cost effectiveness and the recognition that demonstrating cost effectiveness is not just about uh, um, is not just about keeping costs down, but also keeping the effects high. Uh, and I and I love the idea that you're using alternative methods to measure the impacts of the of of the um, uh, of the work that you're doing. And one of the uh, questions that arises out of that is actually based on uh, based on this fact that you're measuring a variety of outcomes. So what sort of outcomes can we anticipate improving given the really comprehensiveness of the interventions? Um, obviously, one of the outcomes that we're looking for is decreases in deaths from suicide or suicide attempts and other suicide-related behaviors that you're seeing, for example, in the white Apache. 
Um, but you're uh, creating a system that, although it intervenes in those most at risk, it doesn't just focus, as you've um, quite eloquently stated, on suicide per se, but really tries to build resilience more globally. So I'm wondering what other kinds of outcomes you're seeing or you're measuring or you're planning on measuring uh, and how you anticipate they might be impacted by the systems of care that you're, uh, you're developing and improving upon. I'm happy I was going to gonna tell, I was yes. gonna nominate Allison uh, to answer that one, but you all may self-nominate. Yeah, I'll start and then I'll, I'll um, pitch it over to my colleagues. I, I think what is so novel about this community-based surveillance system is we're getting population level data constantly through all the iterations of these randomized controlled trials and other trials. So I think that alone gives us an amazing platform to understand what's going on on the population level and be able to compare that to other populations in the United States, including American Indian, Alaska Native, but also non-Native populations that may be experiencing very different trends at the same time. Um, in terms of the outcomes that we're collecting directly from the hub, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Emily, who's our evaluator, just to mention what those are. Yeah, so the outcome measures, we have a, a pretty lengthy battery of measure, assessment measures, but um, these actually, we did some initial qualitative work to adapt and, and uh, develop these measures. And so our main outcome is the SIQ, is suicide ideation. And our secondary resilience outcome is um, Prince Embry scales, um, but those have been pretty heavily adapted. Um, we're also focused on impulsivity, uh, substance use, um, depression, and then hopefulness uh, as well, and ad uh, connectedness um, and cultural issues and interests and self-esteem. So we try and balance our assessment measures always with measuring strengths and mental health promotion and protective factors um, with our, our, risk, uh, our risk scales. And then finally, one of the measures we developed locally, similar to some of the depression um, vignette adaptations or ideation adaptations, um, was when, when our qualita initial qualitative work showed that some of the items that our case managers brought up is really important to focus on. We're not captured by existing scales. We put them into an existing uh, a secondary index to sort of measure really locally relevant outcomes. And so some of the questions on there um, are, are related to, I take care of my health. I care about others. I like to understand how others are feeling. I have respect for tribal elders. And these were outcomes that were really locally important to include and capture and what case managers who had had experience piloting some of these interventions saw as changes in youth, um, positive changes in youth um, due to the interventions. And so we'll be measuring and tracking those as well. And I think it's just due to tribal sovereignty and the forward thinking of the Apache community that this again is against the backdrop of population suicide rates, so death rates uh, attempts, um, in addition to this um, measuring as our primary measure ideation in those who are participating. Super. Well, uh, Dr. Gordon, do you have any follow-up questions or? I think it would be great to, to uh, hear the panel respond to some of the questions from the audience. I see there's a number of them. Great. Yes, there are. Uh, this question might mostly be for Dr. Swick. We'll see. What definition are you using for resilience? How is this measured as a secondary outcome in the study? Thanks, Don. I think that this is such a timely and pertinent question. And uh, to be honest, I don't know if we have a great answer. We can tell you how, what scale we're using in our study. But um, one of the things we're struggling with, and I think Dr. Victoria O'Keefe is really going to lead the future of some of this work at our center, is we use a lot of similar terms for things. We talk about protective factors. We talk about resilience. We talk about strengths-based approaches. And we think that there are some overlap there, but there's also um, you know, some differences. And I think when we first conceptualized this study, we thought kind of resilience uh, was the best thing capturing what the elders intervention um, is trying to do. But I think we're even refining now um, you know, how we um, think about that. So I really appreciate the uh, audience members um, question about this. And I don't know, um, 
I know that Dr. Harrows and Dr. O'Keefe are also, you know, thinking a lot about this. I don't know if you guys would like to add anything here. Sure, I can add that. Um, I think the way that indigenous communities define resilience or strengths is what we need to really focus on. And so I think that's really where some of our future work um, is going to really understand what are those local definitions within communities. Um, I think within a lot of communities, you hear things like, I am strong because of my ancestors. I'm strong because of my family. I'm connected to um, both my ancestors in the past. I'm connected to the current generation. And we're also doing this work for our future generation. So there's this aspect of intergenerational connectedness that I don't think is always captured in um, Western definitions of resilience. So we're excited to explore this new area in the future. Next question, which might be mostly for Marianne Allison, but I'm not sure. Uh, who has control of the data collected and are the participants information and identification kept confidential? Who owns the end report? Again, you may self-nominate, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, well, the, the tribe owns the data, which is true for every tribal community in the United States. And if you ever learn that there's something awry, then it's really important to investigate. But tribes are sovereign nations. They own their community's data. Um, the tribe has nominated our, our Center in the Celebrating Life team to manage that data. So we are managing a secure database. Um, all participant IDs are kept confidentially. Um, but what is unique, and, and this has been a big evolution that I remember back in 2000 when, when this work started, we had people at NIH saying, this is crazy. Like this is a breach of confidentiality to understand someone attempted suicide and now you're sending out case managers to their home. And we had a delegation of White Mountain Apache leaders who actually came to NIH to speak with, at the time, Dr. Cliff Kudry and others to say, no, this is, this. is we're a sovereign nation. Every life is essential to our future. Our networks and our strengths depend on every individual living out the life that was intended by the creator for that person. And so I think now the rest of the world is catching up to this idea of community-based surveillance and how powerful that can be. Um, but again, you know, in a way the participant specific data is projected, but their identity in terms of the follow-up and case management can't be. So it's a balance um, in terms of the, there's always the research side of really looking at those risk and protective factors and outcomes, which is an aggregate. But in terms of the service, those participants' IDs can't be kept confidential, which kind of leads to the stigma question. I think that's in the chat. And Allison, just to add, um, I think this goes without saying, but all the, you know, the papers that you guys have seen cited throughout the presentation, there's a health board and a tribal council that reviews all of those manuscripts um, when we are about to publish them and gives us permission. And so um, they could deny that data to be published. They could, um, you know, ask for additions or changes that are, you know, obviously relevant. And so they, they have control of that process as well. So our next question from our uh, listeners are, is um, related to opioid use and suicide risk. And the question is, could the panelists please speak to remaining evidence gaps with respect to opioid use and suicide risk? Do we have a self-nomination for the answer? I, you know who I would really love to call on is uh, Dr. Uh, Ivanich to, to answer this. We've been working on some uh, manuscripts around this topic and I'm happy to tag team with you, uh, JD, if you'd like. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, so I think in terms of the remaining gaps, I, I think that there's still a lot to learn. Um, to, to be quite honest, I think that there's a lot of regional variations, community variations. Um, and so I think, you know, one caveat to doing uh, indigenous research is that everything has a big asterisk at the end that no community is the same. And so to assume that we know something that always just generalizes to everybody um, is, is somewhat, um, you know, is naive at times. So I think there are commonalities and there's things that we can learn um, and things that definitely, um, 
may translate across communities, but I think there's still a lot for us to learn. And so I think, um, you know, we, we're doing some work around understanding this as a syndemic, as something that is definitely intertwined and, and definitely related in terms of overdose, in terms of intentionality. Um, and so I think there's a lot to learn, but I think that it's oftentimes regionally specific rates in one community don't often transfer to what we understand in different communities for region, regions around culture, um, how urban a community is, access to, to different um, drugs, um, and, and, and a host of other factors. So I think that there's uh, factors both in terms of resilience that we don't really know. Um, I think there's also some risk factors that we don't really understand um, and I think there, there's some amazing work coming out of Oklahoma, but their, their communities look much, much more um, heterogeneous than some of the other communities that we work in. And so what may work in Oklahoma for, um, for opioids and suicide risk may not work the same in the Southwest. So, um, so I know that's kind of like a, a, a big punt to say there's a lot to learn, but I don't know, Mary, if there's something that you wanted to add to that as well. Yeah, I think you really did a nice summary, um, JD. I think the one thing to add is there are some really innovative approaches happening across Indian country already for opioid use. And, you know, I don't know that they're always out there in the research literature. And I think that could be a next, you know, step to really um, evaluate and highlight some of these innovative approaches that are, that are already um, occurring. So I just wanted to add that. And our colleague, Dr. Melissa Walls is leading a, a large opioid um, study that's really focusing on learning directly from opioid users and then working with tribal leaders to create new policies and then going back to learn again from opioid users to see if those policies change um, behaviors and access to care. Great, thank you. Our next question might be for Dr. O'Keefe or it might be for Mr. Garcia perhaps, or for anyone, who knows? How do you address the issue of stigma in helping the individual get help? I wonder if Mitchell or Rose would be willing to talk about that question. Um, I can touch on it. <clears throat> so um, I'm sure in like a lot of other Native communities, um, <clears throat> Speaking about death or suicide is, you know, that's taboo for us. You don't, you don't talk about something that, that in a way that you shouldn't, like, you know, talk about. And a lot of, and a lot of times, um, the way my, the way, the way my parents grew up was that, you know, you don't talk about, you know, suicide. It's something that, that you're not supposed to talk about. But now, as far as as the way things are going, it seems that a lot of youth are not opening up and to talking about, you know, what, you know, exactly what bothers them. And, you know, and that's something that we had to build a rapport with these people or these individuals that, that are struggling, you know, just constantly seeing us and knowing that we're not just there for one time and that we're not going back again. You know, we're constantly checking in on them. If we see them anywhere, even like outside of work, if we see them at a store, we still say hi to them. You know, we're not trying to, you know, we don't um, just, we're not just here for the research purposes, but, you know, me and Rose live here. And because of that, we're going to do our best to be sure that these people know that we really care about them. And we're not just here, you know, just to get paid. You know, if we're here just for that, you know, this job would have chewed us like gum and spit us out easy. Because it does get difficult, it does get hard here on the reservation when it comes to suicide. And some people that we try and go see, like how I shared earlier, that we try and keep a community basis here, that some of the staff leapfrog, so to speak, on individuals that are still struggling. So the more that, you know, they see us um, constantly trying to go and meet with these individuals, the more that that ideation kind of dies down a little bit to where that, you know, people really want to help me. And it's no longer seen as, um, <clears throat> you know, that it's something bad, but knowing that there are people that are willing to listen. And, you know, so I hopefully answered that question. Thank you. 
I thank you very much. Uh, I think you've done a great job. Um, this next question might uh, well suit Jared or Victoria, I'm not sure. Uh, the question is, I am thinking of your example of the young man who was taking opioids just to get high. Have there been interventions based on healthy traditional ways to alter the mind, i.e. chanting, ceremony, dancing, et cetera, and presented to the youth in that way? This will alter your mind. I am thinking from my culture of mindfulness meditation and guided meditation. Does anybody want to try for that? I can start. There are a lot of, um, outside of our center, a lot of other culturally grounded interventions. Um, one that I'm thinking of is um, Dr. Karina Walters, Yapoli. Um, project, which is um, rewalking the Trail of Tears for um, Choctaw community members and really understanding their history and their culture and what it means for their lives um, as an intervention for substance use as well as healthy behaviors to prevent diabetes um, and other outcomes. So I think there are a lot of um, interventions that are really harnessing some traditions. And then, of course, there are a lot of communities that have their own ceremonies and have their own ways of, um, of addressing any type of health or wellness issue. And those are things we may not see in the literature or things that are open to study. And I think that's something that we have to also respect um, with a lot of our communities is, um, are there things we can pull out for an intervention? Are there things we can study? And we really have to learn from our elders, our traditional healers about what is appropriate and what's not appropriate to share. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Keefe. Uh, next question. How do we transition from adapted Western models to ground up models? What are potential barriers to overcome in order to do so? Yeah, I if it's okay, I'd love to just chime in real quickly. I think it's um, I think it's this right here, us talking about it, us acknowledging that that's an important avenue of research that that we need to change that trajectory. Um, far too often, it's been very much so rooted in this idea of evidence-based, um, large-scale randomized control trials as the gold standard. And I think as we learn more from our community members, as we um, work in amazing teams like this um, to do important work with community members. I think we're finding that there is strength there and that there are different approaches that can be taken. Um, and so I think that things like this are, you know, that these efforts are, are leading to that next generation. And I think um, it's an exciting time to, to see what that's going to look like. And as Vic Victoria mentioned, I think that there are other colleagues already doing that in Hawaii and in New Zealand and uh, elsewhere that that we can also learn from. So I don't think it's just a, an us thing. I think we have lots of partners. So uh, I think it's exciting. And I, I would just also mention, um, JD, that some of these, uh, this approach, this very movement that JJ just highlighted, um, I think is really relevant to other communities and populations um, across the country and the world. You know, I think we've been very stuck in this Western um, framework uh, and paradigm, and that doesn't always resonate. Um, and I'm thinking about some of these um, panel discussions we just participated on black youth, uh, black preteen suicide, and sort of the same idea of uh, these models sometimes don't always fit um, communities. And so just always thinking about that and questioning where do the models come from? How do we, you know, is this the right model? Does this actually explore? And, and being very open to qualitative methods and inquiry um, and doing that through real authentic partnership, I think is, is really something to sort of start moving this field in that direction as well. Uh, it's just one minute left, but I think we could slip one, one last one. Is there anything that has been gained in your study that can be applied to the general population in reducing suicide? Anything that stands out? Everything. <laughs> That's the answer. And that's like, that's what we're trying to tell the story of COVID. Native communities have, have led our country in developing really creative innovations to address COVID on a community basis. The same is happening now with suicide. 
And I think getting down to like individual mechanisms is not gonna solve the problem. We have to just ban out, listen to communities and do community-based efforts that are embedded in the strengths and, and are forecasted for the future. So there's so much to learn from indigenous peoples about suicide prevention. And I just hope the world will listen. Thank you very much, Dr. Barlow. Those are very splendid words. That is all the time we have for questions. We do have the ability to download the questions and comments from the Q&A, and we do intend to read those. We may be able to generate a general set of answers for them and share those with the email list generated by the registrants. With that, I'd like to solemnly thank all the people, community members, indigenous knowledge holders, scientists, families, tribal leaders, and so many others who have contributed to this work and shown the strength, strength in the face of challenge, as well as to our speakers and all the staff involved in this webinar. Anyone else? Thank you very much. <laughs>